the Impact Public Service Fund is a nonprofit organization established in 2012. We're a nonpartisan organization dedicated to understanding today's most pressing social and political issues and promoting viable actions for positive change. We share events and news to educate our community and future public servants of our country on the facts, histories, and statistics behind these issues. Tonight's discussion is an important one, and it's gonna be organized in three phases. First, we're gonna hear about the science of climate change. What's true, and where is there scientific debate? Then we're gonna hear from our second panel, which will discuss the future of climate change and what that has in store for us socially, environmentally, politically, and financially. And our last panel will cover the future of investment strategies and private sector approaches to the anticipated change in our environment. The climate is changing. If we look at surface temperatures across the planet over the last 112 years, we see major warming trends over that period. I wanna show you two paradigms. One, we're basically already baked into some huge changes that I think capital markets haven't fully appreciated. But then also there are these lower probability but really high consequence events which are almost impossible to, to model. But the more greenhouse gases we put in the atmosphere, the bigger the risk of disorderly unwinding, things where we sort of lose the ability to, to, to manage all this as things become very nonlinear. These groups are important. They represent 20 to 25 percent of global financial assets in, that are professionally managed. And they're all extremely focused on solving or addressing both the risks and figuring out um, how capital can be allocated to be part of the solution. What we've noticed is they've gone through a, an interesting evolution over the last couple of years. Um, they've tended to start with, first of all, identifying the risk, you know, what, what is the risk? Secondly, quantifying it. Third, engaging with policymakers. Fourth, focusing in on this new concept of portfolio decarbonization. And then ultimately asking the question, okay, how are we gonna invest in climate solutions in the real economy? I think what we're seeing today is sufficient action from regulators, not necessarily in the US, but certainly in every other country that has a strong financial system, uh, in Europe, in the UK, in Japan, in Australia, in China, in Thailand, in Malaysia, in New Zealand, you name it, right? All of those countries are sending really strong signals to their financial sector saying, this is a risk that matters. We're gonna expect you to embed that into your risk management systems. We're gonna to wanna to see numbers and disclosures on how you manage those risks. And so it gets to the point where for the personal opinion of the management of the people dealing with those risk inside a company don't, don't matter, right? It's a regulatory risk and what you believe or your opinions are not really relevant. Um, in the U.S., of course, it's a much more loaded context because there has been years of disinformation and lobbying and financing of uh, fake science. And so we are still trying to get back into a place where we can have a conversation about science, like what we had today, where we can really look at the facts in terms of what are the right responses, what are the right solutions to climate change. Climate change is now becoming a real social justice issue and, and I think based on what we're seeing here in the market in the US and what Emily you were saying it's it's something that we are seeing it's changing the mindset is changing um, globally what we see is that there are numbers of research and reports being published that call for action and highlight the complexities and interdependencies associated with climate change for businesses so it's not just about how a company might impact of have an, its environmental impact, it's also how are climate risks going to impact the business, its operations, its supply chain, and what are the key decisions that such a company will have to make. Since it is having a financial economical um, impact, we see that like the World Economic Forum, for instance, in its uh, 2020 risk report that was released earlier in January categorizes climate change as one of the biggest risks in the global economy with five of the top 10 risks of um, being in terms of likelihood are now the environmental risk. Think about climate change as this broad subject matter, but if you boil it down, you're really talking about more floods, more droughts, more extreme weather, more extreme heat water and food scarcity. So you've got six issues that you're dealing with across the board. And if you want to start in just simple terms as a wealth manager or an advisor and think about what could happen to your portfolio, 
certainly municipal bond exposure, mortgage exposure, and real estate exposure is kind of the first leg of what is going to start to see priced in physical climate risks. Um, everything else is kind of going to come after that. Unfortunately, you're going to get migration patterns because of food scarcity and water scarcity. You're going to have wars fought over water, um, kind of like you're seeing in the China-Pakistan you know, borders now. When you price risk, I mean, you're always forward looking. So the question is, are investors aware of the risks that are coming? And, you know, it's hard to say. Certainly, a lot of us are very aware, of some investors more than others. You can look at uh, the prices of assets that trade, uh, although a lot of these assets are relatively illiquid. You can look at real estate on the coast in flood zones, uh, and you can see impacts for sure. Academics have seen these impacts. So there have been some. And when you think about transition risk, it's particularly obvious in some of the uh, sectors, such as uh, the fossil fuel industry, uh, that has underperformed significantly now for uh, probably 10 years, uh, and, and it's a very significant underperformance. So the question is, is it all priced in or not? We should never underestimate um, the opportunities to redesign what we already know how to do. And this, this to me is the most, uh, creativity is the biggest uh, asset we have at this point. And the reason I say that is that it is um, impossible for even renewables to replace energy that we consume uh, in any reasonable time frame at any reasonable cost, unless we cut demand by a lot. And so we generate about 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy. We waste about 60 of those, and um, 40 of those do the, perp the job that they were intended to do. So uh, Mara Prentice, who's a professor at Harvard, has done a lot of work on this. And uh, part of what, uh, what drives me is the hope that we can, just as we are creatively adding new sources of supply, uh, as a culture, we've always worked by pushing the supply curve, by expanding supplies, instead of ever curtailing demand. If we limit a scarce resource, which is carbon in the carbon budget of this planet, uh, to the highest best use, we will be well served, whether with price or without. The, the call is to limit it to its highest best use.